on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. What's one thing that connects everyone around the world? We are all descended from foragers. Plants are something that everybody would have had their hands in. I think it's so much more true to say that all people are descended from foragers than it is to say we're descended from hunters. Wild plants changed how I cook vegetables from a chef perspective. I thought I had access to everything. There's all these flavors that to the Western palate are essentially like undiscovered today. A lot of people, they're hunting for calories. Herbs get overlooked. There are stages and parts of plants that are so good that we often aren't familiar with. You don't see in our supermarket produce section. You're going to start tapping into that kind of ancient system that is built inside of all of us. I'm more confident in my instincts right now about identifying a plant or a mushroom than I am setting up a, a Zoom meeting. My ancestors didn't use Zoom. Episode 88 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Descended from Foragers with Alan Burgo, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. It's summertime here, and with so much UV, hopefully you're getting enough healthy sun exposure, it's critical that we consume our internal sunscreens, like those brightly colored antioxidant pigments that we see in fruits, vegetables, and especially in berries. If you're lucky enough to have ripe wild berries close by, I recommend you eat them consistently through the summer months to keep the damaging effects of sunlight and other free radical damage at bay. If not, it's important to have a source of vibrant antioxidant pigments in your diet. That's where Sir Thrival's Shizandra powder comes in. Shizandra is the famous five-flavor fruit of Chinese medicine where it's been used for centuries to fight aging, protect the liver, normalize blood sugar and blood pressure, and to stimulate the immune system. It's got an exceptional flavor, tart yet sweet, tangy yet salty, with a hint of herbal bitterness that lets you know you're dealing with a potent medicinal plant. I like to mix a tablespoon of the powder with a liter of water, the juice of a lemon, and a bit of stevia for a refreshing and powerfully antioxidant summer drink. It's a pink super fruit lemonade. Right now at Sir Thrival, when you buy one pouch of Shizandra powder, you get the second one for half off. Go to SirThrival.com and check out the entire product line. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you can thrive? Today's episode is also brought to you by the Hunter's Journey Online Mentorship Program. Whether you're still deciding if becoming a hunter is right for you, you're ready to start a hunting journey of your own, or you're a beginner hunter working towards your first harvest, getting started can be daunting. Where do you begin? What gear and knowledge do you need? What do you do when your strategy isn't working? And most importantly, how do you hunt ethically and sustainably? An ancient and essential part of the hunter's journey is having a mentor to pass on their experience and guide you on your journey. Our guest, Chris Gilmore, from episode 58 on tracking and awareness, has created a comprehensive, one-of-a-kind online hunter mentorship program called The Hunter's Journey. If you want to feel the empowerment of harvesting your own food and you want to do it with ethics and sustainability as your guiding principles, you're going to want to check out thehuntersjourney.com. Chris is currently running an early bird special, and as an additional offer for all WildFed listeners, the coupon code WildFed100 gets you an additional 100 bucks off. Head over to thehuntersjourney.com and use the coupon code WildFed100 to learn to hunt with skill, respect, and heart. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The WildFed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. WildFed food is all around you. Today's guest is Alan Burgo, the forager chef who you may remember from past episodes of this podcast and from our pigeon episode of the Wild Fed TV show on the Outdoor Channel. If you cook with wild foods, you've no doubt found yourself on his website, foragerchef.com. In fact, I was there last night while looking for a venison brisket recipe, which of course I found there. Alan's one of the most talented and intrepid chefs in the wild food world today. He innovates instead of imitates. His work is precise, detail-oriented, and he's prolific, too, constantly developing, writing, and photographing new recipes, posting about wild foods and their preparation, and now releasing a new book, The Forager Chef's Book of Flora, Recipes and Techniques for Edible Plants from Garden, Field, and Forest. I've often commented on this show that we're all descended from hunters, good ones too, or else we wouldn't be here. But Alan's here today to remind us that we're also descended from foragers. 
Most likely, that's the relationship that predates our species' hunting prowess. And unlike hunting, foraging is accessible to almost everyone. Even most cities have foraging groups, enthusiasts, and even classes happening right there in the parks around them. We can all get to know plants. And if you want to know what to do with them, have a listen to Alan. He's certainly one of the plant pioneers of our generation, and that's why they call him the Forager Chef. Alan Burgo, the Forager Chef, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Always so good to talk to you, but I'm especially excited to talk to you right now. You uh, just kind of reached the completion of a pretty long project, man. So congratulations and tell us about that project. So I've been writing a book for the past, I mean, three years. Um, tell us the name of the book and uh, tell us a little bit about that <laughs> that journey. I'm looking at a copy right now, by the way, and I saw that you um, dedicated it to Dottie which uh, is super sweet. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, well, it's called The Forager Chef's Book of Flora. And Dottie is my girlfriend's mom. And she has taught me a lot of different things. You know, I worked with a bunch of chefs. And then I get to hang out with Pilar's mom, who is this organic gardener who started a commune in the 70s. And then kind of all the hippies went away. And then kind of the family came back and it's now kind of a, just a big family compound and it's a botanical paradise. So a lot of the inspiration and a lot of the images that, that I took all the images for the book were shot, you know, directly in Dottie's garden, uh, in the woods around on the property. So it seemed pretty fitting to, uh, to dedicate it to her. I was just with uh, Sam Thayer for a couple of days and, uh, multiple times he brought up both that farm and Dottie. Uh, talking about the foraging out there and the incredible diversity of plants that you guys have. So it has been probably a pretty awesome laboratory for your whole project, huh? Yeah, no, it's it's been great. She has so many things. I mean, like this year, for example, she has stuff that I probably haven't even, haven't even seen yet. I was looking for Virginia bluebells this year because I wanted to eat my first ones. They're delicious. And I, had, I went all the way to Southeast Minnesota to find some. I'm trying to zero in using using my different maps and, you know, the topo maps and everything. <laughs> I spent two days looking for them. And guess who has them growing in her garden? You know, of <laughs> course. It's like that with the, it's been like yeah. that with a number of things. Yeah, man. Wow. You know, the the book is really special, Alan. You know, I, I just want to tell you that I obviously I see a lot of foraging books and a lot of wild food cookbooks. This is sort of something different. And um, I'm curious, you know, one of the things I've noticed uh, and I've sent actually some, you know, I've had some conversations with Chelsea Green set proposals. And one of the things I know publishers love to ask when you have a book idea uh, is they'll say, what's different about your book? than all the other books that are out there, right? Like what makes this different than other wild food books that already exist? And I'm curious your take on that. I think I see sort of from, to my eye, what makes this a really special and important volume for people who both cook and work with wild foods. But I'm curious, you know, your pitch on like, uh, what, what is the, what's, so what's different about this book from a lot of the books that we see out there? Well, it was really born of, it's born of my culinary experience and, you know, kind of my, my restaurant background. But one of the first things is that it's, I didn't want it to be, I wanted it to be a, a descriptive approach to things rather than a prescriptive approach, if that makes any sense. So like a lot of wild food books, what are you going to have? You're going to have a there'll be some leafy greens. We'll start talking about uh, lamb's quarters. There'll be a couple hundred words on lamb's quarters. And then maybe there's some recipes. And then maybe there's amaranth afterwards. And a couple hundred words on amaranth. And then a few recipes. And then maybe it's watercress afterwards. And kind of the same thing. And I didn't want to take a species by species approach like that. Because that's not how I cook. And I really... It taught writing the book taught me a lot about my my instincts too, which is kind of a, another topic. But I I cook with all those greens that I talked about there. I cook with them interchangeably, so it seemed kind of silly to me to to kind of separate things like that when I might use those greens interchangeably in a recipe. But that being said. One of the coolest things about the book is all the research I did 
in, you know, kind of different cultures around the world, specifically seeking out really special cultural examples of where specific species are used. So I mentioned those kind of where I would think they would be appropriate, but I don't say, here's recipes just for lamb's quarters, or here's recipes just for amaranth. You know, that's not how it is at all. But for example, one of the cool cultural recipes is it's called himbe, and it's a traditionally like a Lebanese dish, and it's wild chicory. I'd say use dandelions or like a strong tasting green, and you cook the greens and you mix them with caramelized onions. And that's basically it. And Mm -hmm. it's one of the most popular and historically used dishes of wild plants uh, in the Middle East, I, I would say. And all it is, is onions and greens. You know, I wouldn't really think to put those two ingredients together, but because there is such a deep history of that dish being served, that makes it really cool, you know, because people have been doing it in a specific way for a very long time for a reason. You know, the bitter and the sweet, they play off each other. And it's an example of, you know, a really a minimalist cooking approach that anybody can do at home with all kinds of different plants. You know, lots of different asters would be good. I've been eating a lot of sylphium perfoliatum lately, uh, cup plants, which I think is is really good uh, when prepared right. Dandelions, sochan would be great. Uh, another thing that was really fascinating is that the the name of the dish, and there's a number of different instances of it, of this kind of phenomenon in the book, is Hinbe, the name, or Hindebe, there's, and there's a whole bunch of different names. That name refers to the dish, which is the greens and caramelized onions, but it also refers to a specific type of wild plant. And when I see, when I kept, and I kept on running into these little like golden nuggets like that, where it's like, okay, this is like a mark. It's like a, like a, a cultural culinary marker of of sorts where when something is heavily used in a culture, the name of the green might be interchangeable with the dish and You know, and you will keep, you will see it, see a single name referring to multiple different things. Another super cool one, probably my favorite, is Cheremsha. And I don't think I got to serve this to you when you were out in, in its kind of final form, the traditional form. But Cheremsha refers to Allium Victorialis. It's kind of like a big ramp uh, reputedly brought by the Vikings to Russia. And they take the leaves and they lactoferment them. It gets crazy strong. And then that is a, the lactofermented product is also called Cheremsha. And now kind of the modern day version, you have this kind of like this BS, like kale salad with hard boiled eggs. And that's also called Cheremsha. Okay. <laughs> you know, so they, they don't even use the, the ramp yeah. leaves sometimes yeah. anymore. And there, there's lots of other you know, examples of like, oh, we used to use uh, sea beet and now it's just charred or just use kale. You know, it's, it's, that's not the same. Yeah. Uh, but that's a cool example, too, because Cheremsha is the lacto-fermented product. It refers to a specific species of allium and it refers to a finished dish. I just, I saw that a number of times. I just thought it was so cool, you know? One of the things that strikes me about this book as being a little bit different is the research that you did on it. I mean, I love how you open up the book talking about um, wild plant traditions in Japan and Greece and Italy, where these sort of like mountain plants or these, you know, these various wild herbs or vegetables are used as food. And it seems like you your research wasn't going out and looking at all the wild food books out there and all the wild food cookbooks and going like, how do I remix this information into something that appears unique? But you were going back to these wild food traditions, probably at a time where there wasn't so much distinction between, you know, wild and cultivated and all that, but where people were just using these as part of their daily cuisine or cultural cuisine. So I'm curious if you can speak to that a little bit, like where, you know, how you ended up, what was the journey to, to get, to get to that kind of research and what were the documents you, you were 
looking at? Because um, it's a different approach than what I see most people doing. Yeah, I did not use a lot of wild food books with the exception of an occasional glance at Sam Thayer's because his are the best. Yeah, because you have uh, to. <laughs> yeah, you have to. It's just, there's just so, it's so comprehensive, you know. You know, well, I think I kind of have to first start like what I was doing and I wasn't working in a restaurant anymore. I was supplying the bachelor farmer, uh, which is now closed. And I was supplying them with commercial quantities of greens. Uh, I think I got to bring you in the back door when I delivered yeah, some plants. I remember. And that. that was, that was different because I was supplying someone else so he could cook with all the fun stuff. And also, you know, seeing things through his, through Chef John's eyes, what he wanted what might have been a little bit different than what I wanted. But the real kicker was that I was outside more than I had been in my entire life. I was completely immersed in, you know, the solitary act of being outside, collecting plants by myself and harvesting them in large quantities. And... I just, I had never been so immersed in that before. And I wanted to give him, I wanted to give the chef some ideas of stuff to do with them too, because I had lots of stuff around to work with. And I was, I wanted to work, you know, work on the book at the same time. So it kind of was a dual, uh, I was trying to kill two birds with one stone and they fed off each other. Kind of my, my desire to, to show the chef some interesting things and to to keep uncovering these golden nuggets that I kept finding and really the most inspirational things that I looked at yet yeah, they were not wild food books there were some cookbooks in there but really like ethnobotanical accounts especially of the Mediterranean there's a lot of really cool recipes that are really like old funky recipes from Italy and the Mediterranean in the book and a number of them I got from looking at, uh, it's kind of a thesis on, it's called Mediterranean Food Plants and Nutraceuticals. And it's, it was kind of a study of, you know, the volume and variety of wild species of plants gathered in, in the Mediterranean. That's where I started seeing a lot of references to colejas uh, or campion, which is a different type than I have been picking, but they're a little bit similar. Uh, and it's the like the most widely consumed wild green in Spain. Uh, a what lot do of we reference. call it here? Oh, we'd call it Campion. Mm -hmm. Or uh, Bladder Campion is another name. Silene latifolia is okay. the one that I have here. I'm still looking for the the one that Sam says is even better in his latest book. <laughs> Can you describe the flavor for folks uh, who aren't familiar? The fla The flavor is okay. It's not, I wouldn't say it's as good as lamb's quarters or amaranth or watercress or the one of the greens that I eat a lot of. I'm still looking for the one that Sam says is a lot better. But seeing such heavy documentation on a green made me want to research more of it. So then I start seeing, I start, you know, searching in Spanish uh, and seeing different recipes for Calejas. And from there, I, I kind of use the same approach working with other different plants, like in Morocco, um, they eat a lot of mallow and purslane. Mm. And there's a dish in the book that is basically the super traditional Moroccan dish of purslane and mallow, or it could be, you know, a combination of whatever greens you have. And yeah, then I, I started, I wanted to include something on Sansai, the Japanese can, can we back up for one sec? I want to talk about those two plants you just mentioned. They would be cooked together in this dish you were talking about? Yes. Because they're both such a, I mean, obviously very different flavor profiles, but both I think of as highly mucilaginous, right? So you yeah. kind of, you have yes. that like, um, yeah, almost like a succulent in the uh, purslane. And then the mallow, as you chew it, right, it gets so kind of slimy in your mouth. I love both plants, but uh, describe how they were used together. Uh, I'm curious about that. Yeah, so the dish is called bokula, and it's basically you just cook the greens. Uh, you add a little bit of garlic. Um, sometimes you might see harissa, 
that kind of North African, very spicy chili paste. Mm. Uh, I, I left that out. Uh, there's a little bit of cumin. You just cook the greens, but then you have olives and preserved lemon. And those mm-hmm. are kind of like the connecting points to me, along with using those specific species that would that I would say, hey, this is I think this is a good approximation of this super traditional dish. And you know, if if you don't know, like the mucilaginous greens, like uh, violets and mallow, you know, they can mm-hmm. be a little a little slippery. I, I like it, but sometimes <laughs> you might want to mix yeah. it mix them fifty fifty with something that's that's a little bit different. But knowing that the greens are cooked together. That it gives you a starting point to riff on, you know, and it it's like okay, people have been cooking these this combination of greens for a really long time. I should try it the way that they did it first, and and you know, and not try to reinvent something. You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? So that's another p- approach that I really tried to keep in mind is you know, I'm I don't need to fancy all of these cultural you know really traditional recipes up. I just need to share them because people just don't even, they don't even know they exist, you know? And then Sansa, is that how you say the Japanese word? Oh, Sansai. Sansai. Tell us about that. So the Sansai, uh, and this is another, another cool thing is you have, you have basically, Sansai is kind of a catch-all term. It doesn't mean a single plant. Sansai can refer to a bunch of different plants. Uh, And in Japan and there's a really cool book you might want to uh, uh, link to that Sam and I wrote blurbs for uh, all about all about Sansai with some stuff that I in it that I would have never thought to eat like horse chestnuts. What's the name of the book? Uh, I can send it to you. I think it's eat maybe eating wild in Japan. Okay. But that's a, that's it's a that's a cool one with a lot of like if you want an in depth kind of. Uh, glance at Sansai. That is a, that's probably the best book I know on, on the topic uh, uh, out right now, but Sansai, you know, they could include hostas are traditionally a Sansai. I just think Mm -hmm. it's cool that hostas will grow wild. You know, we just think of them as a a garden plant. Yeah. Yeah. Japanese knotweed, uh, the shoots of Aralia elata, the Japanese angelica tree, uh, warabi, bracken fern, and, you know, Many different things. Some of some of which I've heard have incredibly bitter or strong flavors. You know, which we tend to shy away from in the states. But that that kind of catch-all term for describing plants, that's not just a Japanese thing. That is also a thing in Latin America. You have the quelites, which is I, I love the term. It's like this kind of diminutive, affectionate. Like little little things, like little cute things, <laughs> and the and the uh, the calites, So just like the sansai, it's probably going to include. Uh, let's see, one I haven't had is seepweed, and then all the types of lambs quarters, especially. Uh, I would say the watsontles, which are it's like a giant type of amaranth or a giant type of lambs quarter rather. And one of the things that it's grown for are the un opened uh the unopened flowers the little okay. green balls at the top at the top of the uh the plant and then amar- amaranth is in there and purslane the vertolagas and then in greece you have the same thing uh in greece you have horta and horta will it doesn't just mean a single green it will mean a bunch of different ones and i see a lot of asters traditionally in horta so dandelions wild chicory especially things that are going to be you know kind of bitter strong with that aster flavor uh, that is what i see mostly in horta and i also see that a lot of times the greens are not chopped they're just like cooked in water and then put like giant noodles on a plate and oh then, cool you know and anointed with tons of olive oil and fresh lemon yeah uh, so those are just a couple examples of, you know, kind of these, these culinary, you know, blanket uh, colloquial terms used to describe plants, but used to describe terms of endearment for, you know, a bunch of different wild grains. And it kind of got me thinking, you know, more and more, you know, 
it got me thinking like, you know, what's one thing that connects like everyone around the world? I don't, I don't usually think of like wild food connecting everyone around the world, but every single person on this planet, you know, we are all descended from foragers. Every mm-hmm. single person, we all have ancestors that went out and used wild plants and interacted with their landscape in some way. And the more I thought about it, I was just like, man, this is, it's right. You know, we can't say that about too many things in the world. You know, I think that's such a really cool point because when you look in the anthropology, you constantly come up upon this idea, like we're all descended from hunters, which is also true, but there's this, there's this thing in in archaeology where the lack of plant preservation over time leads people to be so focused on tools made of stone and not of plants or you know artifacts of stone and not things that are you know we don't see a lot of net or cordage that survives we don't see a lot of bows or you know fire kits and things like that what we see is a lot of stone tools and bone and so there's this like often this overemphasis on the hunting side of things and this lack of uh, representation on the plant side. And you could say everybody's descended from hunters, but hunting is something that's typically been in the realm of males, uh, whereas plants are something that everybody would have had their hands in all through human history, going back before our species into deep antiquity to a place where, you know, there's not even hominins yet and where we are plant eating, you know, apes still. So I think it's so much more true to say that all people are descended from foragers than it is to say we're descended from, you know, hunters. And so, you know, I I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of thing, but I hear it all the time. And sometimes it it feels very one-sided to me, you know. No, totally. I think that's a great point to make, especially with the distinction between like, you know, yeah, hunting seems to have been mostly like a male, you know, activity. Uh, that's a, it's a good point. Yeah. And, you know, plants, obviously, you know, everybody would have had basic fundamental foraging skills, but also would have worked with plants for fiber and for dyes and for tools. And, you know, we've come so far from it because, you know, now you talk to so many people, you must encounter this even more than I do, which is like people who have a sort of a plant phobia, you know, wild plant phobia, where you'll say like, hey, this is edible. It's really good. Try this. And people will be like, I don't know. How do you know it's not poisonous? You know, you get those kind of responses. And it's funny based on what you're saying, just how kind of far we've come really and not that long of a period of time either that people have kind of gone so deep into domestication that you know, the idea of wild plants is so foreign to them. And then you start digging up these things like you're talking about. Like I see Horta on, you know, Greek menus all the time. Like uh, it wasn't that long ago that these plants around the world are being utilized for food. Now, one question I have and something we've talked about on the show before, are these like poverty food traditions or are these just culinary traditions? Like how, you know, is there any distinction there? Is that sort of a blurry line? Well, I would, I would say that it, could be both i would i would say there's probably a lot more use of them in poverty and subsistence situations um i would i would like to hope that there would be both but you know especially in italy like the especially in the south uh the cucina povera for sure you're going to see lots of wild plants Talk to us a little bit about how you've uh, broken this book up because you've got these four distinct sections. And again, it's just different than I've seen things done before. And I really appreciate this fresh take. You know, when your friend tells you they're writing a book, it's always like, oh, let's see if this is going to be a unique offering or not, you know. And uh, I really do think you've kind of brought something fresh to our community. And I think you've, you know, you always talked about, I think we actually named one of the shows you've titled one of the shows you've done with us before, um, the final frontier of food. And I really feel like your book is bringing us, you know, it's pushing us further along, you know, there's something, I'm not just saying that to you, man. I I really believe it. Like I'm, I'm looking at this book going like, this is finally something really different, you know, a different approach. You're not just taking recipes and working wild greens into them. You're really kind of building this wild food 
cuisine out of these ingredients and the way you group the ingredients is really unique the way you think about them is really unique but talk about how you broke the book up and um all these you know different sections that you have we'll get right back to the show in a moment but first have you ever thought about your light diet we think about the food we eat and the water we drink but what about the light we consume each day and especially at night It's important because our light diet or the light we consume through our eyes is like a kind of electromagnetic nutrition and it influences our circadian rhythm and hormone production. Our bodies need that crisp blue light of the early day to set our circadian rhythm. That's our body's internal clock and that's why it's so good to head outside first thing in the morning to jumpstart your day. But our computers, tablets, phones, home lighting and vehicle headlight LEDs also use blue light that tricks our bodies into thinking that night is day upsetting our melatonin production disrupting our sleep and even impacting our all important mitochondrial function that's where raw optics comes in raw optics produces the finest blue light blocking glasses to filter out the unhealthy or rather untimely light from our devices helping to optimize our light diet and restore our circadian rhythm Unlike the rest of the industry, raw optics are the only blue light blocking glasses that use melanin pigment infused lenses, not an external coating that can be rubbed off. They're streamlined and stylish and they have daytime and nighttime designs. Don't be fooled by near clear glasses that claim to block blue light. They're a gimmick. Raw optics are the real deal. If you work on a computer, spend a lot of time on your phone or drive at night where bright blue LED headlights are shining in your eyes, you need to check out raw optics. Go to rawoptics.com and use the coupon code WILDFED to get 15% off your order. Again, it's spelled R A Optics and you'll get 15% off by using the coupon code WILDFED. Now, back to the show. So the first section, kind of like I touched on earlier, is, you know, it's on green leafy plants. And instead of separating them all by species, we decided to separate them into kind of sweet tasting greens or greens that are very mild tasting and then strong tasting greens. So that's kind of a separation touching back on like instinct. That's an instinctual way to cook. Uh, So if you have lamb's quarters, you could substitute them for watercress. If, and on the other side with the strong greens, if you have some dandelion greens, you could substitute them with sochan and then The next chapter is on the garden and that one is kind of, it's kind of a lesson on how, how wild plants changed, how I cook vegetables from like a chef perspective. Uh, And yeah. And I think the best example there is, well, you know, running a restaurant, it's easy. It's easy to have a restaurant and being a chef, especially to be an echo chamber and to think like, you know, I'm running a farm to table restaurant. I am so deeply connected with the seasons. I have my hand on the pulse of nature. The farmers will bring me anything I want. I snap my fingers. I can have it there tomorrow or whenever the next delivery is. And I have this huge list of things that they will bring me. And I, I was kind of there. I thought I, had, I thought I had access to everything. And then one day I was out in the garden and, you know, I was looking for maybe looking for some mushrooms, looking for some plants. I was on the edge of the garden, kind of by the woods. And I saw this plant that I didn't know. And I bent down to look at it. And I'm like, what is this crazy looking plant? It's got this shoot that looks like this little fairy tale vegetable with these little curly cues. And I just looked at it. I'm like, this looks so delicious. So I cut one of the shoots and I brought it in. And I've been cooking with, you know, as many different types of heirloom squash as I possibly could for years, I had never seen a squash plant, (laughs) you know? So, so being a chef trapped behind the stove, I I thought, you know, Oh, I'm so connected to all, all the local food. It is a disconnection of sorts. Wow. Because I did, I had not seen the plants growing, but using the instinct of foraging that I had built, I saw the plant in a completely new light. And then I started, then I started doing the research and then I started digging into, okay, where is this plant used? Where are these parts of the plant used? Where can I find this, uh, you know, in, in different references and resources, cookbooks, whatever, what languages do I have to search in to find them? Does it have a particular name, a pet name? How can I find the keys to unlocking it in the cultures where it is traditionally used? 
And luckily, my girlfriend's stepfather used to live in Nepal. And he said, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, pumpkin shoots? Oh, they make them in curry in Nepal. So I'm like, okay, there's one thing I get to research. And then I started talking with some people from Latin America and doing some other uh, research on, on that. And I discovered this soup, you know, th- I didn't discover, I come across it. It's called sopa de guias or guias. And it's basically a whole squash soup. So you have the squash vines, the squash leaves, mature squash, squash blossoms, and then these little masa dumplings uh, called uh, chochoyotes. And they kind of look like little round gnocchi with an indent in them. And it's a whole squash soup. And it completely changed how I think about uh, squash and gourds. Yeah. And, and especially from like a subsistence perspective, when you think about it that way, if you are growing vegetables to feed yourself, let's say back in the day, like in the little house on the prairie days, for example, because there's actually some recipes taken directly, almost directly from the little house on the prairie books, which I loved growing up. Uh, oh, it got cold really fast and the, the pumpkins are not going to, uh, they're not going to make it. So they take the pumpkin inside when it's unripe and they make a pie out of it and they cook it with vinegar and sugar. And it's basically a mock apple pie. Man, I but, had that when I was visiting you there in Wisconsin, you served us, um, what I would have just been like, Oh, I'm eating an apple pie. I would have, I was blown away that, uh, that a, that a pumpkin could produce such a fine tasting pie. I mean, I was just, I mean, I've had pumpkin pie before, but this wasn't how that you did it, right? I mean, it was it was like it had sliced apple in it. It was incredible. Yeah, and th- from like a subsistence perspective, are you gonna? Is someone gonna wait until this plant is until the you know the squash is quote unquote ripe? Are they gonna wait if they need food, or are they going to be harvesting from the plant the entire time? Right. Uh, and then, so the, after the garden chapter, and there's a bunch of other cool examples of kind of using that, f- the foraging lens to appreciate more of the plants that we know and love. Uh, but then there's a chapter on herbs and herbs, I think are, are really special because, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people in our world, they're hunting for calories and, and things like that. And herbs, herbs get, they get overlooked, uh, aromatic things, sp- you know, different things that you can use to flavor food or flavor liqueurs like the herbs. My knowledge of studying herbs is basically the reason that I worked with the distillery last year and we released uh, a number of different types of flavors of liqueurs. We're going to do that again this year. Uh, and I'm talking to a kind of a, a big distributor who works all over the United States, too, about working with a specific plant in the book. Um, but the herbs, there's tons of potential. In that. Flavors that so, people haven't ever really encountered before um, in the modern era, too, right? I mean, you know, one of the things I think why it's it's not hyperbole to say like the final frontier of food is because there's all these flavors that to the Western palate are essentially like undiscovered today. Yeah, especially when we talk about like the Western palate, you know, it's a lot of these things are going to be have been used around the world. Um you know, I know in Scandinavia, they will work with Meadowsweet and Meadowsweet. And I basically write this in the book. If you like elderflower, I think, I think the title is move over elderflower because <laughs> I, I, I like elderflower. It's okay, but it, it is nothing compared to Meadowsweet. So the Meadowsweet is in the rose family. And then I, I talk about this too, like, I'm, and I know we talked about it in another podcast, so I won't go over it too much, but it, it's in the same family as like apples and almonds and cherries. So meadowsweet, instead of just being kind of like intensely floral and elderflower stuff, it, it can almost get like sickeningly floral to me sometimes. Yeah, yeah, right. Meadowsweet just tastes like almonds and flowers. Mm. Yeah. So you, you get a floral quality, but you also get this punch of almond, uh, which is just so cool. And I don't see anyone working with that. I think, I think people should use it a little bit more. I think they'd like it. And if you, if you're in the right kind of area for it, it likes acidic soil. Uh, I usually pick it up on the North shore. It grows like a weed and it's, it can be quite aggressive in, in some places. 
I want to um, go back. Well, we we got one more chapter to talk about, but I kind of want to bump back to the previous chapter and just bring up this uh, this section you have called "Shoots Expanding on Asparagus." I just I really appreciate this piece here because in the culinary world, asparagus is like one of our closest to wild plants that we see routinely on the plate. Um, but it's to me, it's been elevated to a level that. I mean, that's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I think it's fantastic. But there's so many incredible shoots out there that provide such similar qualities on the plate. Uh, so I liked how you approach this. And I was just wondering if you could talk about it for a second. Yeah. So I absolutely, I, I, I tried to word that pretty carefully because I don't want to talk smack about asparagus. Yeah, I, I, eat, a, right? I eat a lot of asparagus <laughs> and asparagus yeah, is, you know, it is awesome. one of the fine, it is one of the finest shoots that we can eat. But knowing, you know, taking that kind of lens and thinking about, okay, so what other shoots can I eat too? You know, I don't want to say any shoot is better than asparagus. I want to say, let's eat them all. Mm -hmm. You know, they, yeah. they can they can all be good. One doesn't have to be better better than the other. Uh, but that kind of that kind of mentality or the thinking, I don't think a lot of people think about asparagus as a shoot because it it, it really is. And, you know, asparagus is like grows to be a big kind of ferny looking bush. It's one know? of those plants that, that like you were sort of mentioning before with squashes, I think a lot of people who've spent their life eating asparagus would not recognize it if they saw it as a mature plant. Absolutely. We, I just had someone new in the garden the other day as a younger lady and she's like, what is this plant? And there's this, like, there's like asparagus ready to pick all around it, all around this mature <laughs> one that Dottie was letting go to seed. And we said, that's asparagus. No way. Yeah. Like totally. If you never, if you haven't seen it growing, it's shocking. You know, how, how would <laughs> what you know? It becomes, yeah. Yeah. yeah you just tend to think of the shoot as the vegetable, you know? So it's like, oh, that's just on its way to becoming the vegetable. Yeah. We eat it when it's quite young and meristematic. Yeah, totally. And then, you know, kind of on another point, you know, the vegetables that we see and more so, more specifically, if you go to the grocery store, the vegetables we are sold may have a lot more to offer than what you see on a shelf because what you see on a shelf is kind of the you know it's the intersection of how much profit does it make what is the shelf life like you know tomatoes are you know often harvested before they taste the best so they can get jostled around in a box and ship from california or mexico or wherever but plants can have a lot more like broccoli i talk about broccoli leaves in it broccoli there are species of broccoli that are not grown for what we think of as broccoli. We think of broccoli, what do we think of? The meristematic unopened flower buds. In Italy, they have a number of different species of broccoli that are only grown for their leaves that can be like two to three times the size of collard greens. Oh, wow. Okay. And they're super delicious. It's called, uh, it's called spigariello, which is as, just as fun to eat as it is to say. <laughs> and you know, and this it's similar. It's like if you, you know, everybody eats garlic and knows garlic has garlic in their kitchen. But unless you go to farmers markets or you grow it yourself, like you don't see scapes, you know, typically in the supermarket. But it's another great vegetable. And so, kind of to your point, there are stages and parts of plants that are so good that we often, you know, aren't familiar with in the in our in our supermarket produce section. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And there's you know there's some that I wish that there's a lot of stuff. We had to cut a lot out of the book. There was an entire chapter on fruit too, but we oh no kidding they they, they made me cut twenty five thousand words and over a hundred recipes out of the Whoa. book. <laughs> it was yeah, it was like taking my baby, putting it in a blender, pouring it on the floor in front of me, and saying, "Put it back together." Oh, it was book that was two. it was rough. Book two. <laughs> What's yeah. this? Um, the Angelica flower pods here. I'm seeing Zav Zavirn. How do you say Z that? Zaverni. Tell us about Zaverni. This is super. cool. Oh, so the Zaverni. The Zaverni are there, I think, in the book that I read about them from is Patience Gray uh, is where I read about the traditional name. I, I had eaten cow parsnip blossoms, and I just found them myself and thought, oh, these are awesome. I got to try them. And I kind of instinctively just, you know, put them in a little coating and fried them up like cocoon broccoli is another name for them. These clusters yeah. of unopened flowers in there and they're delicious. Yeah, so, and just but, to speak to that, you've got a photograph of one that's been cut in half uh, sort of sagittally and it does look like, like a, like a 
little rapini stuffed inside of a casing, like uh, the way it. So you called it cocoon broccoli. It's a really good description <laughs> for it, you know. Yeah, but the angelica. We think of angelica. I think of it as an herb, and it is the, the flavor is uh, at least with our our local species and most of them are going to be really strongly flavored. We have Angelica atropurpurea here. Uh, the flavor is intensely strong. Uh, like you're, you are not going to just eat Angelica raw by itself. Describe but to people the, some of its relatives that they'd be familiar with so they'll get a sense of the kind of flavor profile you're talking about. Yeah. Well, the, the flavor profile is like if you just eat some, you might think soapy gin or eating <laughs> yeah. eating a handful of like perfume essential oil or something like that it's it's incredibly floral yeah. it's it's so floral that it, you most people would not like it at all uh it, i i would not like it like that but funny enough and the, the meristematic parts especially these uh the unopened flower buds and also sam showed me actually last year you can like chisel out the the heart of the plant before the flower, I want to say before the flower stalk comes up when it's like buried inside of the stem, uh, those parts you can actually just cook uh, or, or blanch them and then let them let them soak in a little bit of water is the traditional way uh, that, that I read as it is described. And it still has a little bit of the perfume equality, but it's mellowed out enough so that it's really nice. And you can serve them savory or you can serve them sweet. So mm. one of the things I did is you, I just kind of fry them up, get them nice and crispy, and I'll drizzle them with honey and flowers. And it is, oh yeah, it is a fascinating dessert for sure. <laughs> but you can also just dip them in garlicky mayonnaise, and they're going to be great too. Yeah. And then I kind of got us off track because we didn't get to chapter the fourth the fourth chapter, nourishing. Tell us about that one. Yeah, so the fourth chapter is all on like nuts and starches. So I want, I really wanted to do, I really wanted to honor, you know, first like wild rice, uh, because even in Minnesota, if you say wild rice, most people think of black patty rice, mm -hmm. and the flavor is complete. It is completely different from like the the not blackened, you know, hand finished, especially if it's cooked over a wood fire. I mean, because I've had some like Sam's rice that he's brought over that he does himself is like, it tastes like smoked. It, yep. It's, it's a completely <laughs> yeah. different. You have so a whole good. bunch of different spectrums of flavor. Uh, but the black patty rice, it tastes like mothballs to me. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, so there's and a whole thing on wild rice. Too, right? It's hard to chew. It takes it takes a longer time to cook. One of the fascinating things that I found while cooking, you know, I spent weeks cooking all the different these different types of rices, trying to disseminate how how can I figure out and you know how can I distill for people? How do you find the good stuff? And one of the funny things that I that I didn't hadn't thought of before is uh, black patty rice. It takes longer to cook, right? It also soaks up like almost twice as much water so it's heavier oh, as well interesting. yes so it, it yeah it soaks up way more water because i and then i as i thought about it i was like it makes perfect sense because i eat this stuff and it's so heavy you know yeah. i'm not going to sit and probably just eat like a side of blackened rice i will use it for some things like it is perfect for flour uh, like grinding up and making making flour that's why most, that's why I want to say most of the time when we see wild rice, it's like, you know, Uncle Ben's, you, they got some sprinkled in the mix. Right. Because, yeah, because just you want to eat a belly it's full so of heavy. That. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. true because when you, when you eat the, the truly wild stuff that's been hand processed, I mean, I can eat kind of huge amounts of it. It's very light. It's very fluffy. It's very easy oh, it's, to chew. It's, it's so soft. good. And it's like breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's any time of the day, a snack, cold, warm. I mean, it's Ooh. fantastic stuff. It's a completely different product. Um, after the rice, I, w I really wanted to go into nuts. And I am, talk by the way, the most excited bit. about this. When I, when I look at overall my wild food approach, you know, and you, Sam, you guys go so much deeper into plants. You know, I, I put a lot of time on the animal side and it, it eats up a lot of my time too, you know, processing and stuff. And when I look at the overall approach that I have, 
where I'm like, man, I need to put some energy towards the nuts. You know, that seems like a lot of bang for your buck and there's a lot to explore there. And, uh, you know, I'm just super pumped about this chapter, man. These pictures get me so lit up. So, all right, there's my lead in. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So the, the nuts, I wanted to have a chapter in butter. I wanted to have like a mini chapter within the black walnut chapter on butternuts that we had to take that out. Uh, but there's basically an entire nose to tail or like root to fruit approach to eating black walnuts. <laughs> oh yeah, finally. Yeah, so so <laughs> it goes that. totally. So it goes through everything from you can cook with everything from the young leaves of black walnuts. Really? To of course, a- absolutely. I, there's a book in there that I reference. It's like this 150 year old book called old housekeeping good housekeeping in west virginia or maybe old housekeeping in west virginia i don't know uh but the the book is referenced in there specifically and it's got all kinds of other stuff like that i couldn't fit in there that i wanted to test and you take the leaves and you can make something called bay sauce so they would take young black walnut leaves and you want to use the young ones the young ones have the best aroma they're gonna have the most aroma to them and the older leaves kind of lo- they lose their juju as the plant you know starts making putting energy into making the green nuts. What's the aroma like? Uh, is it anything like when you rub the exterior of one of the nuts? It is the exact same. I would say slight, not as crazy punchy yeah. and strong as if as like scratching a green black walnut, but it is the same. Cool. Wow. So they take the leaves and then you I, I describe it in the book. You layer them with grated horseradish onions, spices, lots of black pepper and salt and add some good apple cider vinegar. And then you let it sit. And like with many things made with black walnuts, you let it sit for a while, you know, like at least a month or two and the tannins settle. And then it's like a salty vinegary condiment. Uh, Oysters never met a better partner or you can mix (laughs) it with like a little bit of butter or something or use it as a seasoning wherever you want but it's a super cool historical use of making something out of black using black walnut leaves and i had never i had never even thought of that at all so and cool. then after that i started seeing different variations people puree the leaves and like literally like consume the leaves after after the maceration process um, of sitting with the vinegar My, mine is strained it's kind of a clear clear bay sauce but there are some versions i've seen where they say mash them all up rub it through a sieve and you'll get more of kind of a pulpy sauce so you can like literally eat the leaves too and then from there i kind of go into uh using the green the unripe nuts which are super fascinating and you know it's they're more than just like making lots of people make nocino nocino is just like the tip of the iceberg Tell people so what that the, is. Uh, Nocino, well, that's it's the Italian name or the Italian version of a liqueur that's flavored with green, unripe black walnuts. And I have a recipe for Nocino online, which is like the old house recipe I used to use. And there's a French version too. So I actually give a recipe for the French version instead of the Italian one. The Italian one's just made with uh, Everclear typically, and it's and it's really good. But I already had a recipe for that online, and I wanted to make sure to share something new. So Vendenois, or walnut wine, mm. is the the alcohol infusion in there. And it, it includes brandy and red red wine. But you can use white wine, too, and you'll get kind of more of like a vermouthy. Uh, you'll still get some tannins from the red wine in the finished product, but you can use white wine, too, for, for less tannins. And it's that's super cool. I'm I'm interested in this black walnut ketchup recipe as well cuz I'm picturing how cool that flavor would be in that kind of condiment application. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about it. Yeah, well that I mean that's a that was a traditional Ingr- English recipe, you know, cuz there's ketchups made out of all kinds of stuff and really the f- the flavor comes across a little bit like it's a little bit like A1 yeah, that's what I was picturing. Uh, actually, cool. You know, but again, yeah. like I, I didn't. You know, it's just a, re- it's a historical recipe that I just kind of riffed on a little bit. And props to Hank Shaw for suggesting xanthan gum because that, 
improved the the quality and the texture of the finished product a little bit of xanthan gum um but the fascinating thing with with that recipe that really speaks to how interesting just black walnuts are by themselves is the first part of the recipe is you put them in water and you just put the black walnuts in water with nothing else and the, the shell fermentation, you're talking about? no no the whole the green whole, yep. just whole right. green walnuts Okay. When they're when they're young and tender, you cover them with water, and they ferment more vigorously than just about anything I've seen. Hmm. And there's no salt, so I I need to ask some of my geek fermentation friends if that is technically alkaline fermentation because it doesn't use salt. Uh, I would suspect that it is. Uh, either way, they ferment like crazy, and some of the tannins leach out. And then afterwards, after the fermentation's done, you take them, you chop them up, cook them with a bunch of onions and spices and a uh, bunch of anchovy, and then you puree it all up mm. and strain it, and you get a sauce that tastes reminiscent of A1. Mm. <laughs> this sounds delicious, man. Made from unripe walnuts. So you mentioned that, you know, cutting a whole section on white walnut, butternut, you, you mentioned uh, a section on fruits. So I guess uh, kind of a two-part question is, you know, you've been writing for three years, and, and when I visited with you, I could see that the process was pretty intense, um, especially because, like I said before, you're doing something really novel here. So, you know, this took a lot of original research and obviously a lot of time in the kitchen, too. And, and I, yeah, I assume you did your own photography, knowing you. Um, so there's a lot of work went into this. So I imagine at one level, you're like ultra relieved to be done uh, and to have this sort of time between but then i you know i'm guessing there's more uh in the future so tell us a little bit about you know how it feels to be done and then wh what's next uh it feels incredible to be done like i can't part of me just thought like i was like i was going to keep moving from different chamber like now we're in the marketing chamber now i'm in the editing chamber i was going to keep moving to these different chambers and they were never going to end <laughs> yeah. It was like, it's, I'm never, go this is never going to actually happen. Uh, you know, and in the beginning I had, I had one of the most difficult parts is in the beginning when I was, you know, out gathering stuff for the restaurant and being outside every day and coming with, coming across these, what I thought were just these incredible, you know, examples of cultural cooking of wild plants from like all across the globe. I took my original proposal and I scrapped it. Oh, wow. And I basically started from scratch because they also, it was going to be a seasonal book, like with a, like totally by season. But so it isn't, uh, it, it is kind of a seasonal book. And it's still, if you read it kind of as a seasonal cast, like, uh, or cadence rather, because the nuts are like in the back, you know, and <laughs> right, the spring, right. spring greens are in the front. So it still has a little bit of the skeleton it retains there. Retains a little but, of that, yeah. But I gutted it and took out like a lot of the old recipes from like the restaurant days and tried to just get as much new stuff in there as, as I could. Especially it must've been a little challenging because you, you know, on your website, you've produced so much content. So, you know, now you've got to do all this original stuff after, you know, I mean, one of the things that one of the things I lament about social media is that it becomes like an unpaid full-time job for people where it's like you're expected to produce free content that 20 years ago you'd have been paid to produce. Now you produce it all, you put it out there for free, and then you read comments from people being like, wow, oh, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. It's like, man, oh, Lord. it's free content. Uh, you know, and you do really high-end content, really beautiful stuff, right? Your your website's gorgeous. Your, your social media feeds are really nice. So you had to produce... You know, there must have been a lot of pressure, you know, to to produce a lot of novel content, I assume. Oh, the, totally. But the more stuff I, I kept finding, I was just like, there, there's so much. There ended up being <laughs> too much. Like I said, we yeah. had to cut over 25,000 words. Uh, the, the most difficult part was just not sharing the exciting things. <laughs> like when I, when I came, when yeah. I tasted, when I took the lid off the jar of the wild vanilla extract for the first time, and then I started cooking with it, I wanted to just scream at the top of my lungs, like, you guys, right, you guys right. got to find this plant. You got to find it. 
Like this is. Uh, were you, it's were you ever crazy. worried like somebody else is going to get onto it and like be first to market with the idea or anything of that stuff? FOMO feelings. <laughs> well, there's there's stuff from. I mean, yeah, there's there's stuff from the mushroom book. I have I've made a company sign an NDA for using it in some. Uh, they, <laughs> I t- totally, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not even going to talk about it here. It's <laughs> not time yet. We'll talk about it when the mushroom book comes out. Uh, okay, so that's but, what I was getting to. So this book is Flora. <laughs> so that means there's there's you're going to follow up with uh, with what? What's the plan? What's your big yeah, picture plan? Yeah, well, it's Flora Fungi. I, I use the Italian pronunciation as kind of a nod to uh, to all the guys from Italy I worked with, and then fauna. So vegetables oh, really? mushrooms and meat yes no way oh yeah dude you're speaking my language oh that's awesome that's yeah awesome. so yeah the the mushroom book will be all about mushrooms the, all the different fun funky things you can do with them especially with the same cultural you know the deep dive into the cultural specialties of different species i'm so excited yeah. about, about doing that uh and then the meat book will be like underused animals game and then a large section on organs cool wow yeah this what a contribution alan i think um you know you're really well known for the work you do with mushrooms you know but this plant book is so unique and different i'm just really excited for people to get it in their hands and um i think it's gonna you know it in the way that sam's books have really revolutionized how foraging literature is looked at i just think you you know you've put a you've kind of created a fork in the road for you know what the expectation of of foraging slash you know culinary wild plant stuff's going to look like so it's really awesome so you know and not to push you too far towards the next book because obviously now's the time to sit back and get this book out and do all the media and all that but how much downtime do you have before you you know you get started on the next project uh well i think it's probably i think i'm looking at my workload I don't know if I'm even going to be able to come up for air and even be able to think about it until this mushroom season is done yeah. and the, and kind of the the winter comes and I can shut myself away and just make an outline. And then I think I'll probably take the next year to, uh, you know, I can do the, the research in the winter and come up with all like a lot of the ideas and I have huge, you know, files and stuff that I've saved for like, you know, whenever I come across something, I say, oh, that's cool. I'll research this further, stick it in a file. So I'll probably take a, a year to develop all of that. And, you know, not throughout, now that I've been through the process, it should be, should work a, l- a little bit quicker, yeah, but, right. but we'll see, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to put it out until, until I feel good about it too. Something you said earlier in the beginning of our conversation, and I, I want to come back to it was you mentioned instinct and um, I wanted to, you to just flesh that out a little bit more, what you were talking about. I wasn't really clear what you meant there, but you said you said something about it. I want to give you some space to expand on that. Yeah, well, I think one thing that I'm so thankful for that I just kind of was thinking about the other day is, you know, how, how foraging and being involved, being involved, you know, now just kind of being half Anthony Bourdain, half Indiana Jones, <laughs> hunting plants and mushrooms for for a living i gotta pinch myself when i wake up how yeah. how it has really affected like how it's affected like my psyche yeah. uh and our our instincts i think we really take them i think we i think a lot of people you know most americans are they're going to to overlook them and touching on you know all of us being descended from foragers too we all have everyone has the instincts kind of in them already, they just need kind of a little bit of a jump start. Uh, for example, I was, I was out, I was trying to really, I really wanted to hammer the pine pawn this year. And I did my, my previous record was in an afternoon. I got two cups of pawn after <laughs> sifting what, what and everything. Uh, resin, pine, red pine, pine is resin. Okay. Also. Yeah. So, I got two cups and I was like, oh, this is an entire day of work. And I'm talking like eight, nine hours out there, you know, <laughs> to, to, with the, and yeah. this, this time I was like, okay, I'm going to, I can get it. I can really keep an eye on it and I can do better. I think I can do better. And I went out to the spot that I usually go to. And as I'm, as I'm harvesting the pawn, I just start 
thinking more critically about about what I'm doing. And I start seeing the branches uh, that are lower and have the grass up around them. They are chock full of pollen. And the the upper branches, they, they got some pollen on them. Like you can, you can hit them and then they make a nice little, they make, make a good poof. They look pretty decent. But I saw the branches on the bottom where the wind wasn't hitting them. And mm-hmm. I said, where can I find a tree where all the branches look like this yeah. and kind of that instinct started to kick in and I felt like I was using like a third eye or something. <laughs> and then I just started thinking, okay, where, where is this place where I need to find the habitat? Where can I find that? And I went to my grandpa's house and he planted a whole bunch of red pines behind his house and it's really well insulated from the wind. And I went there that day as the sun was going down and in the span of an hour and a half, I got uh, five cups of pollen from his place alone in an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. But I just thought it was a, a good example of kind of using our instincts and, you know, just being outside and interacting more uh, with your environment you're going to start tapping into that kind of ancient system that is built inside of all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, I feel like I have a lot more, I'm more confident in my instincts right now about identifying a plant or a mushroom than I am setting up a a Zoom meeting. You know, (laughs) my my, my ancestors didn't use Zoom, but they, they did pick plants and mushrooms. You know, so it's like we all have that inside of us and it's not like you got to, you know, build the bike that you're going to ride from scratch. It's like the bike's just been sitting in the garage. You just got to polish it a little bit. And the more you use it, the kind of the stronger it gets. But I think we really undervalue our instincts uh, as foragers because, you know, the more you use them, the stronger and, you know, the, the more you will tap into, you know, what's kind of already inside of all of us. Yeah, it gives you access to like what's like it's like the roots of human cognition and problem solving. Right. Yes. It's like that's sort of like you said, going like, okay, if I if I'm finding the pollen here, then you know, you reason out like, okay, then this is what I'm looking for. And you start to understand like how we develop these incredible brains that we have as a species. That's a really cool way to look at it. It's like Sam reminds me of Sam Thayer's great sound bite, you know, learn something old. <laughs> right right on yeah man uh this i'm just really excited for you alan i i, I if it didn't sound condescending I, i'd say i'm proud of you i mean i don't mean it like you know good job son but that's it i mean totally it like fine i'm just excited for you and uh i think you've you've made an incredible contribution here so for people where do they where do you want people to go to uh find your book and, and i'll just say like this is one you know if you're in the wild food game you need this one in your library so where, where do people get it well i got a page on the website there's a whole bunch of different options because you know people like to buy things from different places also like logistically ordering from Canada, you got to, you may have to use a different outlet. If you're ordering in Europe, you might have to use a different outlet on oh, Europe. It doesn't, it's not going to come out in Europe until September 23rd. Uh, but June 24th here is, uh, when it will be live. I just, I just got some and got to have the first book signing yesterday, but there's a page on the site that has, uh, all the different options. So you can pick and choose whatever you like. Uh, some that's, support small bookstores. My favorite is you can support Sam Thayer's operation and order directly from foragersharvest.com along with a whole bunch of awesome other wild food products like acorn oil, hickory nut oil, and all the sweet stuff that they do. That absurdly good applesauce that they do. (laughs) I don't know what they put in that. Yeah, I can just sit there and just eat it and eat it with a spoon. That's what I've been doing. It's crazy. And actually some shockingly low priced maple syrup. I was like, Sam, you get a hundred bucks a gallon being who you are. He's like, nope, I do it at redneck prices, just like everybody in my town. You know, I was like, <laughs> I respect that man, but, uh, totally. get more for it. um, so that's really cool, man. So they can go to foragerchef.com uh, and see the, uh, see that all those options. Yep. Yep. 
Cool, man. Well, I've been, uh, this has been a great conversation. I, I just can't say it enough. I really appreciate this contribution. I mean, so many, we're in this like renaissance right now, right? About around wild foods. There's, um, the, the ball's been advanced down the court a lot recently, you know? And, uh, so you start to see, you know, it's sort of like the, the cookie cutter boy bands or something, you know, you see a lot of the same thing like over and over again. Uh, and so when you see something different, it's like, yes, this is what we need. We need something, a fresh take. And, uh, yeah, just congratulations. Enjoy all this, uh, buzz that's going to be around you as uh, the book gets out there. I'm really happy for you. So thanks so much for your oh, time. Thanks. Today. And, and speaking of things that are different, let me just say that the wild fed show was awesome this year i mean can we can we you know be happy about that too this is great thank you so much man well you know what's cool about that is uh when we came and filmed with you we were like this is going to be for our season two and when we went to the outdoor channel they said hey we want two more episodes we want to bump it up to 10 and uh it was an easy pick to pull your episode and put it in there so i was really glad to get that one out and uh, yeah we're just getting ready to go film season two. Oh, by the way you know i'm gonna go uh i'm gonna go down to kentucky next week and um i'm gonna be shooting the brood 10 uh, cicada harvest and and cooking with cicadas and stuff and Sweet. and uh, i had just done i recently did that social media post and i saw you did like a survey uh and i was wondering what the results ended up being Oh, I, I tell you, I haven't even looked. Cause it, cause uh, just for listeners, you had done like what an Instagram story where it was like, are you into this or not? It was like the picture I had done of the cooked cicadas. And yeah, when I looked you, at I it, I was a lot more no's than yeses. You know? Oh, the, oh yeah. No, shoot. I, I should have looked at that. I ha, I have not looked at that yet. Cause some people were like, you can eat those. And then you got people like my man, Michael Hood in, uh, I think he's in Indiana and he's, you know, probably got like two four gallon Cambros filled and freeze dried <laughs> and they, you know, and it's, they're going to last him the next 25 years, yeah. you know? So there's a broad, really, there's a really broad spectrum through like some people are like, they're getting as many as they can. And some people are like, that's crazy. That's a bug. I, I'm not going to eat that. I mean, I, I have to thank you too. Uh, before we sat and talked in my kitchen, I had a much different opinion on entomophagy and your, your story about, you know, not eating meat and how it helped you. I mean, that, that was a paradigm changing moment for me, man. Like, oh, that's th cool. I, thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. You know, when I was cooking the cicadas, my friends were, my friends were from Louisville were, were picking the wings off and I'm going, what are you doing? Like, that's the part. <laughs> that's the best part. Yeah. Like I love dragonfly cause you got all that wing surface, you know, and that crispy, I don't know. I'm trying to like think of something that I can just, it's like a bit like nori sheet, a bit like temper, something. I don't know how to describe it. Cause it's almost like a if you could fry cellophane or something, you know, but they're picking those off and I'm going, don't do it. But, uh, yeah, the peanutty flavor, they're fantastic. And uh, I'm excited to see all the stories that are going to come out of this emergence, you know? And, but now I'm thinking like, man, can I chase around? Cause Wikipedia has got a great map of all of this, the periodical cicada, uh, emergences and when they're going to happen. And I'm like, man, can I eat from all? We've got 15 total in the U S it's like, oh, can wow. I do them all? You know, I'm going to chase them around. I think so. Pretty cool. But anyway, let me know what the results are of your survey. and uh, For sure. I'll, I'll check them out here. Yeah, man. And thanks for your contribution to Wild Fest. One of my favorite episodes. And uh, yeah, I love the scene where you and I are heading into the uh, barn and you've got this grin on your face that every time I've watched that episode with people, they're like, oh, look at him. He's just like, he's like a little kid right now going in there to get those pigeons. So anyway, yeah, yeah no, that's a was, very well-liked episode. It was a lot of fun. Well, thanks for your time today, man. And uh, uh, looking forward to the next time we can connect in person. Yeah, no, it's great to talk to you as always, man. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.